D.E.V. Accordigalair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. Following the release of the German plot prisoners in mid-March of 1919, the second session of Dáil Éireann took place in private from the 1st to the 4th of April. The first day was concerned mainly with changes to standing orders and the constitution, and ended with the resignation of the ministry appointed in January. Following this, Eamon de Valera was elected as the new president, and the next day he put forward his new ministry. The former president, Cahal Brua, was appointed as Secretary of Defence, and Arthur Griffith was appointed to Home Affairs. Owen McNeill was given industries, demoted from finance which went to Michael Collins, and Countess Markievicz was made Secretary for Labour. A number of women had been appointed to revolutionary governments in Eastern Europe, and she now joined them as one of the first female ministers in the world. In reality though, very few of these departments would function in the years ahead, having neither the power nor the money to do anything, and on top of this, Dáil Éireann would be suppressed by the British authorities in September. Cahal Brua, in defence for example, exerted practically no control over the IRA during the War of Independence, which acted instead, sometimes, on the orders of its own general headquarters. Count Plunkett was the nominal secretary for foreign affairs, though all of the work in this area was being done by Sean T. O'Kelly in Paris. There were exceptions, however, the main standout being finance. On the 4th of April, the ministry adopted a proposal to raise £250,000 sterling through the sale of Republican bonds at home, with the same amount again to be raised abroad. Michael Collins would oversee this gargantuan task, communicating with the nationwide network of sales agents and hiding the funds raised in a series of bank accounts in Ireland and England. He would even establish and bury in babies' coffins a proto-national gold reserve. When Britain tried to shut down the bond drive, he deployed his apostles in the squad. In March of 1920, Alan Bell, a resident magistrate sent to track down the money, was taken off of a tram in Dublin and executed in broad daylight. Collins had announced a massive reception for de Valera on the 26th of March without the approval of Sinn Féin. The reception was cancelled when Dublin Castle issued a ban and thousands of British soldiers were deployed on the day to make sure that nothing went ahead. Collins was reprimanded for his brazen actions and though he and other militants would be isolated in the months ahead, he continued to build his intelligence network. In January, he had met Eamon Broy, a detective sergeant who worked in G Division, the branch of the Dublin Metropolitan Police concerned with monitoring political crime. Broy had turned double agent and was feeding information to the Irish Republican Brotherhood. He had warned them about the planned German plot arrests in May, but it took too long for them to receive or act on the information. Collins wanted Broy's help in understanding G Division and putting together a plan to challenge it in the campaign ahead, telling Broy that... If the Irish volunteers did not resort to violence, the movement would collapse. Broy was often left on duty alone overnight at DMP headquarters, and this presented an opportunity for Collins to gain access to their archives. On the night of the 7th of April, Collins was smuggled into the building, and from quarter past twelve until five in the morning, he read as many of the documents as he could, taking great enjoyment from the description given in his own file. Broy noted in his Bureau of Military History statement that Collins wanted to know the exact degree of British knowledge as regards the Volunteers, Sinn Féin, and other national organisations. Michael wanted to ascertain who of their people were known and, still more important, who were not known. He wanted to try to gauge the mentality behind the records and then use the police secret organisation as a model for volunteer requirements. With a better understanding of his enemy, a number of G-men were accosted by volunteers on the 9th of April and warned against showing excessive zeal in their work. Those who ignored the warning would be dealt with by the squad. The next public session of Dáil Éireann took place on the 10th and 11th of April. On the 10th, de Valera proposed that members of the police forces acting in this country as part of the forces of the British occupation and as agents of the British government be ostracised socially by the people of Ireland. The people of Ireland ought not to fraternise with the forces which are the main instruments in keeping them in subjugation. They are spies in our midst. They are England's Jansenaries. They are the eyes and ears of the enemy. These men must not be tolerated socially, as if they were clean, healthy members of our organised life. Although it wasn't meant to, the boycott of the RIC would prepare the ground for the attacks which would later be carried out against them in force by the IRA. The boycott was taken up throughout the country and extended to family members. 
they were ignored by their neighbours and refused service in local shops. Their central position in social life collapsed, destroying their ability to gather information. Morale, already low due to poor pay, collapsed utterly, leading many to leave the service. Often those that stayed behind became heavily embittered towards those who had shunned them and would wreak revenge on them with the arrival of the Black and Tans. The majority of the two-day session was given over to discussions on the League of Nations and Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Owen McNeil read a statement on the freedom of the seas, and considerable time was given to addressing Irish America. Long discussions were held on areas the Dáil had no real power over, such as social policy and communications. Many, including de Valera, were banking on US support for Irish self-determination, though Sean T. O'Kelly was making little progress in Paris. Later in the month, the delegation appointed by the Friends of Irish Freedom in February would meet Wilson before travelling on to Ireland, again getting no solid commitments from him. The release of the German plot prisoners allowed for a full session of Dáil Éireann to assemble, and British authorities may have hoped that this would solidify moderate control of the movement. Instead, there was a slow nationwide escalation in violence and continued raiding for arms. The volunteers had taken part in a series of prison breaks, and issues of the Irish volunteer newspaper, on Taglach, were becoming increasingly militant. British authority was starting to collapse. In response to Limerick City being proclaimed as a special military area, a strike was declared, and the city was ran for two weeks as a workers' Soviet, forcing the military to back down. May would see the rescue of Sean Hogan at Knock Long, an event which would go down in legend and act as a bridge between raiding for arms and doing something with them. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of old.